This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. I want to welcome you to this episode of Real Talk. We're getting real today. Uh, Charles Adler, legendary talk radio host, joining us in just a couple of moments. Uh, per tradition here, you know the first episode of every week. Uh, we get his dose of Canadian common sense on what's happening in the world around us, including oftentimes right here in our own backyards. It's been just over a week since Hamas carried out uh, the deadliest attack in Israel's history, that nation uh, counting 1300 casualties from that attack on October 7th and recently updating the number of hostages taken as Israeli intelligence officers continue uh, to try to free those hostages nearly 200 of them so says Israel 199 people civilians for the most part taken captive now the counter offensive by Israel most significantly into the West Bank has claimed Almost 3,000 lives. Hamas says 2,750 Palestinians have lost their lives, a quarter of them children with 10,000 more injured. If you're like me, your gut's twisted up into knots. It's very, very difficult to see something like this happen in a region that has seen <clears throat> conflict over many decades. But this feels even different, doesn't it? And the division is difficult to ignore, including in Canada as pro-Palestine rallies are carried out, as some people, as some corporations, as some sports teams announce that they stand with Israel. And these statements designed to show support oftentimes are driving people apart. So, real talk, what do we do? How do we wrap our minds around it? What's the appropriate, informed, empathetic response? Can we even talk to each other about stuff like this anymore? We're going to keep those conversations going through this week, including with Charles, in just a couple of moments. And of course, in episodes to come with other people coming at this from different perspectives, lived experience, informed understandings of why things are happening the way that they are. We'll also talk about Saskatchewan today, invoking the notwithstanding clause on that battle for so-called parents' rights. We'll talk about the former premier of Manitoba apologizing for the PC campaign most notably invoking the deaths, the murders of two Indigenous women believed to be in a landfill. And we'll take a look at the story that made waves across the country just a few days ago as the Supreme Court dealt a blow, you might call it, if you're putting it lightly, to the federal government's plans for climate change. The Environmental Assessment Act, the Supreme Court, in a pretty overwhelming decision, a 5-2 to two decision saying that Provinces were not respected when it came to that Bill C-69, as it was known at the time. You remember Jason Kenney dubbed it the No New Pipelines Act. And Alberta's current premier, Daniel Smith, went even further off the top of my head, I think calling it the No More Anything Act. You'll be hearing from those politicians and others as this episode moves forward. The court says that the power of decision making, in particular approval of certain projects, belongs in the hands of the provinces. But bigger picture, what does this mean for Canadians? I mean, provincial politicians will tell you it's a big win for them, and it is. But shouldn't we all care about the environment? I think most of us do, but what's the right way to go about protecting it? Maybe we'll figure this all out before the end of this episode. We'll see. The episode's happening with the support of our friends at Rello, who want to remind you that this is a perfect time of year to make good and move forward on those plans to get your career kick started again. If you've been thinking about starting a new career, being your own boss, running a thriving business, leaving cubicle life behind, plus you're intrigued or even motivated by unlimited earning potential, a career in real estate could be your perfect match. You can get started today by enrolling with Rello. That's R-E-L-O. Rello's Alberta's top real estate school, and they want to support you every step of the way from studying for your exam to getting your license and beyond. Plus, with Rello, you can study 100% online on your own schedule. People love that. And right now, there's a great deal for real talkers. You can save 20% off any Rello course. 20% off with the code REALTALK. All one word. That's REALTALK. The promo code for 20% off 
at Rello.ca. Charles Sadler is a longtime political commentator and podcaster. You likely read his columns in the Winnipeg Free Press. You can find him, of course, as the host of the Charles Sadler Show, wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, every Monday or the beginning of every week right here on Real Talk. It's nice to see your face. Have a decent weekend. Not a bad weekend, but uh, let's let's face it. Um, for any of us who are paying attention to the news, especially from the Middle East, um, specifically Gaza and Israel, um, it, it's not a pleasant weekend. No, it's brutal. And uh, and I was looking forward to connecting with you today to having a, a real conversation. And I know that yeah. the audience expects that uh, we're, we're going to have, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll bring background to this and you bring perspective to this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but Chuck, at the same time, like uh, my heart just hurts. Uh, I see people I know and, and people that I care about, friends of mine that are arguing yeah. over this uh, every single day. Group chats are getting, I'm going to say, polluted over this because people feel yeah. very strongly. And uh, and I think that the average person right now is looking at this and, and feeling like they've got to pick a side. And then everyone's saying, don't yeah. both sides this. And I don't know, man. I might, I, like I said, right out of the gates here, my gut's twisted up in knots yeah. for more than one reason. So... I try to bend over backwards uh, to wanting to support the ancient notion about every argument that there are always two sides. Here's here's a problem with this one, and the problem started 10 days ago. When you've got uh, thugs, terrorists, I don't care, you want to call them militants, fighters, I really don't care what you're calling them. But when you've got men uh, crossing into Israel, literally, um raping and, and kidnapping. I'm not going to get into the most graphic uh, situations about the babies and have arguments about the babies. I find those arguments are ridiculous. Um, you know, babies were, were clearly uh, killed, uh, set on fire. Um, all of the other specifics about what was done to the babies and what wasn't, people say, well, do you have proof of this? Do you have proof of that? The point is, babies were included in the massacre. Rapes were part of the massacre. There are no two sides to that. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that happened. 199, we now have a number. 199, most of them civilians, were, were, were kidnapped. They're, they're in Gaza. Hopefully they're still alive somewhere in, in Gaza right now. Uh, corpses of, of Israeli soldiers were, were dragged through the streets. Uh, people on the streets were, were celebrating. You know, there are no two sides uh, to those things. I don't care whether you have a religious perspective, philosoph philosophical. Uh, yes, obviously, there's, there's as many years of background about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. There are many things that are unfair about it. We've discussed them on this show. You've had many guests discussing. But there, there's no amount of perspective from history that gives justification to the, the massacre it, itself. So there are no two sides. There was a massacre. There's only one side as far as that's concerned. Now, as far as the response is concerned, here's my my, my, my problem with this. And I, I put all my biases in the shop window. I'm the son of Holocaust survivors. I, I have a, a personal stake in, in Jew hatred. My, my family suffered a great deal because of anti-Semitism. So do I support the Jewish state of Israel? Well, of course I do. The Jewish state of Israel is supposed to be insurance against a Holocaust. So every time you see something that is a reminder of the Holocaust, like the massacre in Israel, you naturally, if you're if you're a human being walking in, in my shoes, you naturally take a particular side, a particular perspective. There, I would be in, in need of serious psychiatric care if I didn't have strong feelings about what happened 10 days ago. I think most people would be. But in particular, because of my background, I have a particular bias. There, I said it. I, there'd be something wrong with me if I didn't have a bias. But here's the problem with all of this. The, there would be no Israel if there was no Holocaust. So in that sense, I wish, obviously, that we never had a Holocaust, even if that means no Israel. The Holocaust is a, a bigger deal for me than, than anything else. Six million Jews were wiped off the face of the earth. I, I cannot imagine how many children and grandchildren there would be if you added it all up, if they had survived. I can't imagine all of the massive contributions there would be to this uh, planet uh, had the Holocaust not happened. So you've got the state of Israel. And if you're a person of Jewish heritage, and I don't claim to be religious, I'm not observant or anything like that, but I am what I am. 
And so if you're a, a Jewish person, the last thing in the world that you want to see is your people doing something nasty to the other people. So while I, I can't stand the, the idea of a Palestinian having their uh, hands on a weapon and, and murdering Jews, by the same token, the reason that's so difficult for me is I know it forces young Jews to kill Palestinians. That That's the most difficult part of this ethically for me, and that always has been. But I know bloody well that I've just got to man up, as it were. And if Israelis did not respond over the many years as they're responding right now, there simply would be no Israel. It, it's, it, it doesn't take a, a, a scholar to understand that if, if Israel chose not to defend itself, and defending yourself, yes, does amount in this particular case to removing uh, Hamas uh, from having any authority because Hamas uses its authority, uses its rule, to do whatever it can to kill as many Jews as possible. So the time has come to take out Hamas. How the hell do you take out Hamas without killing innocent civilians? So you've got killing of innocents on both sides. There, I'll, I'll say it, regardless of what my biases are. Well, that's true. My that's biases, a fact. My biases don't blind me from reality. Yeah. Both sides. Both sides are getting killed, and it's extremely painful for me. And so you're in this position where, and I've, there's people in the live chat right now, and there's, you know, over the weekend, and we see this in Canadian cities, we're seeing it around the world over the weekend, you know, for people that in Edmonton, the Hen Day is like the ring road that goes around the city. And there's a big demonstration, a big pro-Palestinian demonstration, everybody flying the flags uh, on the Anthony Hen Day over the weekend. Interesting, by the way, and we don't need to get into the weeds on this, but some, some people uh, who are complaining about the inconvenience of the pro-Palestinian rally were being questioned how they had felt or whether or not they had supported the, the truckers rallies, which had happened on the ring road around the Anthony yeah. Henday before. It's yeah. kind of becoming this new prominent form of, of protest, but I digress. So people will be critical of that pro-Palestine rally or, or, or very much in favor of it, right? Some people will say, well, it's important to support Palestine. Palestinians are not Hamas. Hamas does not represent Palestinians. To a certain degree, that's true. To another certain degree, Degree. Uh, there are realities that that Hamas is running the West Bank. Hamas is attacking Israel. Hamas is Just, expecting. Not, not, I don't want to interrupt you, Ryan. I really don't. Uh, Hamas is not running the West Bank, and that's been said by a number of people over the years. Uh, Hamas is running Gaza. The PLO is is running Pardon the West me. Bank, and they are they are not the same. They are enemies. Uh, PLO people, many of them, were murdered by Hamas uh, for Hamas to have the power it now has. Good correction. I appreciate that. Is every Palestinian represented by or, you know, happy to be represented by Hamas? Obviously not. Are children being killed, innocent children? Right. Yes, that's a fact. Are the elderly being targeted? Yes. Are civilian targets being hammered? Yes. I mean, this is a fact. And I see it gets to a point now uh, where, where and, and my personal torment, which is multifaceted on this, includes the fact that by speaking out last weekend – about pro-Palestinian rallies that were timed concurrently with assaults on Israel as they were happening, people are now looking at their fellow Canadians in a lot of circumstances and saying, ah, well, you've picked your side, so what do you think about this? And then they'll present some horrific situation in Gaza, which everybody can agree is tragic and infuriating and, and numbing and, and all the things uh, and I don't even know that we're able to have, I mean, I, Chuck, we took our little guy to the uh, Edmonton Oilers home opener over the weekend. And, and there's this moment uh, before the puck drops where all of a sudden up on all the big screens, the blue and white, the Israeli flag, it says the Edmonton Oilers stand with Israel. And honestly, I've never experienced anything quite like it in an arena that 30 seconds previously had been rocking so hard. You thought that the foundation might be compromised. And then some isolated cheers and whoops and hollers. And then this unignorable silence as well. And then kind of a murmur below that of people going, ooh. Yeah. 
Now, there are some insights here. I certainly don't speak on behalf of the team. Uh, It's obvious. I think everybody knows that the owner of the Edmonton Oilers is Jewish. Uh, I think that probably played some role in this. But even just the fact of that, like organizations planting a flag and then people looking and I just, I don't know, man. I want to have this conversation so other people feel like they can have this conversation and we can talk about the fact that nobody's cheering or very few people are like actively exclusively cheering for a side in this horrible conflict well you know i mean i don't really care how controversial uh, this gets because if i was afraid of uh, saying controversial things i would have been out of this business a long time ago or i'd be like you know 99 percent of people in the business are just another no name uh, god bless all the no names so i've got a name and i've got a heritage and i've got a heart and i've got a head and uh, if i were having a private conversation with the owner of the Edmonton Oilers, knowing that he is Jewish, I would say to him, I'm asking you as a fellow Jew not to do this. Because in doing this, all you're doing is making Jews a target. You're giving the anti-Semites, the Jew haters, a baseball bat. You're basically telling them that the Jewish Oilers, the Owners of the Edmonton Oilers are Jewish, therefore they, they will they would call them the the Jewish Oilers are naturally siding uh, with Israel as Palestinians are being oppressed in Gaza. So I, I don't like giving uh, my opponent a baseball bat, and I'm not saying that that's what the owner here is trying to do, but I think that's that's what he's doing, and I, I don't think it's a wise move. And so here it is. I'll be happy to. I guess happy if I can use that word. I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll take the quote controversial stand of saying uh, it was not a not a wise decision, and I don't think it's something that's helpful to Israel. I don't think it's helpful to Jewish people in Edmonton or, or anywhere else. Not a great look the week after they take away Pride tape and all that as well, and then yeah, it just I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm against obviously taking away the Pride tape, and I think Gary uh, Bettman is a is is a is a real wimp here. He's wimping out to the Ron DeSantis uh, right. I mean, that's what so much of that is about. Um, but you know, the, the the thing is that nobody nobody who is of any heritage, whether you're of Palestinian heritage, Jewish heritage, nobody should be afraid to stand up for what they think is right. But this is Canada. I, I'll never forget. Uh, uh, it was a, a broadcaster uh, in Toronto uh, who uh, privately, so I'm not going to mention his name, uh, but everybody in Toronto would know his name, um, privately castigated me for saying uh, on a particular overseas trip that I took that when I came back to Canada, I kissed uh, Canadian soil, which is something both of my parents have done. And he said, you shouldn't say things like that because A, they're not believable, and uh, they they make you look ridiculous. And I, I told him, I said, look, you have no idea why I have strong feelings for this country. Much of it is my background. It is the Adler family's promised land. And yes, I have kissed Canadian soil several times. And I can tell you that I have kissed Canadian soil since since the massacre 10 days ago. I thank goodness for being a Canadian. I thank goodness for the fact that our people do listen to both sides. I don't kiss Canadian soil because many Canadians are pro-Israel or, or, or against anti-Semitism. I kiss Canadian soil because only in a country where both sides, all sides, get a say and fair democratic dialogue is encouraged. Only in a country like that are most of us safe. The easiest way for people in this country to be unsafe is for the government and other authorities to squelch all sides or to promote only one side. So I love Canada, and at times like this, I can't tell you uh, how uh, how proud I am to have a Canadian passport. I want to invite Real Talkers to be part of this conversation uh, on top of the YouTube live chat that happens every single morning. The majority of you see this later in the day or later in the week. You can send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com or you can find us on any of our social media channels. Uh, that's at Real Talk RJ on, on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I want to let our audience know as well that 
we're working with the United Nations right now um, and, and making progress, but obviously a lot of people are trying to uh, gain an opportunity to speak with Francesca Albanese. Um, we're hoping that that'll happen this week on the show, and we will keep you posted, so stay tuned to our Twitter account for announcements on this. Francesca is the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967 and affiliate scholar as well uh, on the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University. And we appreciate those of you that have been working with us. You know who you are and we'll recognize you. Um, there, there are real talkers advocating for us with the UN to make that interview happen. So we'll keep you posted. Uh, more from Charles Adler in just a second. We'll talk about the Supreme Court uh, basically dropping the hammer on the Fed's climate plan. I mean, I don't know if I'm being dramatic with that, but we'll, we'll see what Chuck thinks. Plus, I want to talk about uh, Premier Mo and Saskatchewan, the notwithstanding clause. It's significant to invoke it, most particularly early in the process. It's kind of designed, uh, so say the architects of it, back from the early 1980s for when all court options have been exhausted, and that's not the case right now. Uh, plus, we'll get into Heather Stephenson's apology, former premier of Manitoba, as uh, the PC party licks its wounds after Wab Canoe and the NDP's big victory there. This conversation is happening with the support of sponsors like Athabasca University, who invites you to imagine AU is transforming lives and transforming communities. The Athabasca University story is one of open flexibility, and that's everywhere. Families, jobs, communities... The most important things in people's lives are changing, and to prepare for that change, we've got to be more open, more flexible, more adaptable. We're driven to learn. So is the average Athabasca University student that's creating and contributing as they study. AU is transforming lives and communities. You can learn more about their pledge to students by visiting imagine.athabascau.ca. Athabasca University is Canada's open university our friends at eden landscaping want to remind you that <laughs> yeah well winter's coming and we won't focus on that too much now still the beautiful colors of fall the downtime when in the landscaping business is the perfect time to get the design conversations happening eden landscaping is a custom landscape builder with more than two decades of on the ground experience in the greater edmonton area if you want to see shovels in the ground on your dream project this spring have it done by summer you're going to want to get in touch with them today oftentimes you want those special materials they've got to be procured supply chain considerations means that you want to have uh, the most time possible the best way to work with eden landscaping is to start a conversation by visiting their website that's landscapeedmonton.ca and friesen brothers alberta grown and alberta owned for coming up on 70 years, what an amazing story is reminding you about their German-inspired all-you-can-eat October feast meal that's coming up on the 21st and 22nd of October, just a few days from now. A German-inspired all-you-can-eat dinner, including Alberta beef roulade, chicken fricassee, German potato dumplings, sauerkraut, German rye sourdough buns, the full salad bar, and more. Just $25 per person at all Friesen Brothers Fresh Market stores. You can find out the details. That's October 21st and 2nd from 4 to 8 p.m. You'll find the information at Friesen.com slash Oktoberfest. Well, on Friday, after we wrapped up our show, uh, by the way, Charles, we, we figured that everybody could use a break from the news cycle and, and, you know, maybe just sort of realize that not everything around us is dismal. Not everything around us is heartbreaking. Uh, we celebrated Cheers to Alberta Beers on Friday, and uh, we had three experts in Alberta beer join me around the roundtable and had so much fun with that. It warmed uh, the hops of my heart. Oh, very well played, my man. I'm happy to hear it had you all the way up to the suds. Uh, but yeah, yeah. A, bit, a bit of a different vibe on Friday morning for us. But of course, the big story Friday, the national headlines, the Supreme Court uh, essentially... Uh, agreeing with what the provinces have been saying for years now. And that was that the feds yeah. were overstepping with their yeah. uh, impact assessment act. How bad is this for Justin Trudeau and his climate plan, the five, two decision in favor of the provinces? When the Supreme court uh, slaps you as I, you know, I did for those people who are watching, I did a little slap on the, on the wrist visual here. When uh, the Supreme court uh, slaps you, uh, spanks you, whatever visual you choose um, it's, it's not a good day. And I remember when Jason Kenny and I, we're very good friends and had a very 
warm relationship. Uh, Jason Kenney was thrilled about the, you know, cancel the pipelines, uh, the laws, uh, the, 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 whatever, whatever. It, you, you, you have a good, better memory of what he specifically called them, right? What was it? What was it? What was the line that Jason Kenney used on? On those 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 laws, those pipeline. Uh, the, the, are you you mean the No More Pipelines Act? Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah, no yeah. More pipe- so when 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 that, when was, that happened, by the way, began, very effective politicking because I yes. think a lot of people thought it was. I think a lot of people still think it actually was called the No More Pipelines Act. Right, a right, shrewd right. move so, by Kenny. So so I mean, I, on on the one hand, Jason Kenny is an Albertan was not happy, but as a as a politician, I mean, it was Christmas every day for him. Sure, where he got to talk about the No More Pipelines Act, and uh, as far as I'm concerned. The best moment that Danielle Smith had, or if you want to look at it from the other point of view, the worst moment that Rachel Notley had was when uh, Rachel Notley tried to say that she was a pro-pipelines person and that she stood up to the uh, federal government. Uh, out came Danielle Smith, just as uh, Jason Kenney would, with a, a litany of the things that the that the government, the federal government, had done that that Rachel Notley did not take a, a stand on. And I thought it was just a rhetorical pistol whipping. When I saw that, I just thought. Uh, you know, th- this election is over. Danielle Smith has has, has won this thing because that's that's a moment that t- you can never take back if you're if you're Rachel Notley. So on this particular piece of the puzzle, the uh, the Supreme Court decision and and how does it affect uh, Trudeau? Well, it, no matter what Trudeau tries to do, and and just for the for the record, um, the government, which means the taxpayers are are in the hole for God knows how many billions of dollars. Because the Trans Canada Pipeline, the the the, the what what Trudeau did do in having the, the government buy uh, the pipeline that's that's going to BC, uh, it's not going very well. Uh, it's uh, it's slow. Uh, we've got a, a problem apparently with, with customers. There are a number of other problems. Many people listening about to this know far more about it than I do. But I'll just put it this way: it's not making a buck. It's losing a lot. So just to, for the record, uh, the government has tried to do something about a, a pipeline, extending that particular pipeline all the way to uh, uh, to British Columbia. It's in uh, bad shape, especially financially. Uh, but the Supreme Court basically has given the Conservatives another hammer. And so uh, the Conservatives are not stupid. I may have my 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 quarrels on some things that the Pierre Polyev says and does and the whole you know, uh, sort of a wannabe uh, Trump uh, business that they do, uh, trying to impersonate what the American right does. I may have my, my quarrels with that, but let's just stay with the big picture. Big picture, it doesn't matter what Justin Trudeau does from now on with respect to energy policy. Uh, Pierre Polyev will always be able to say, oh yeah, uh, that's that's that, that's the guy who the Supreme Court disagrees with. And he can say, we're not saying it, the Supreme Court has says it. Having the Supreme Court, a Supreme Court judgment on your side from a, a, a political perspective is a very big deal. And I'm positive that Jason Kenney was all smiles on Friday. Yeah, well, he called it an historic decision. And, and it was a big one. And it was a big win for the provinces, even just the optics of it uh, with the general public. So you could expect, and, and, I, and I'm not going to say gloat, uh, but you could expect that Alberta's current Premier, Danielle Smith, was going to be pretty excited about it. And, and I think that we'll play a quick clip of her from the podium. This is post-decision, obviously. Uh, you can feel her excitement with the real realization of of the ammunition that the provinces have moving forward. Here she is. We are extremely pleased with the Supreme Court of Canada's decision confirming the unconstitutionality of the federal government's Destructive Impact Assessment Act. This legislation, also known as the No More Pipelines Act, but I've been calling it the Don't Build Anything Anywhere Act, is an existential threat to Alberta's economy. And we will continue to fight against Ottawa's unfair overreach that continues with their uninformed and unrealistic electricity regulations and oil and gas emissions cap. They uh, will damage our economy, they will stifle development, they will erode constitutional rights, and they will ultimately harm all Canadians by putting jobs at risk and making life more expensive. Alberta will simply not accept being handcuffed by Ottawa's unfair overreach with another blatant attempt to erode and emasculate the rights of constitutional authority of the provinces as equal and sovereign orders of government. <laughs> emasculate. You, you don't hear premiers using that word very often. No, I mean, but, but the Supreme Court has, has given the, the, the federal conservatives and obviously uh, the Alberta UCP uh, a great uh, big hammer. It doesn't matter what uh, the government uh, does from now on, uh, what Ottawa does. 
uh, Danielle Smith and others will always be able to say, well, you know, this, this is a government that has a, a record, and it's important to say that, a record for unconstitutional behavior in this area, and uh, we as a sovereign government don't need to accept that. I don't know if you've seen uh, Jason Work's piece. People can read it at cbc.ca. I want to definitely give him credit for this. He's the one that spoke with Howard Leeson, who was uh, Deputy Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs uh, in Saskatchewan's Alan Blakeney governor, uh, government. That was, you know, back in 1982, or at least in 82, the negotiations that repatriated the Canadian Constitution, creating the notwithstanding clause. So this is, you know, essentially one of the architects of the notwithstanding clause. Uh, and, and if I go overly basic on this, please jump in and, and correct me. But basically, the notwithstanding clause gives a province the, the right to suspend rights for some people to recognize or preserve the rights of other people. Ostensibly, that's the reason for it. Uh, and it gives a province kind of a five year window where it's policy. The law is essentially immune from court challenge. It's been mused about uh, in past. I mean, there was obviously talk, Ralph Klein famously uh, threatening to invoke the notwithstanding clause when it came to gay marriage uh, back in the 1990s, which when I think back to that uh, makes me feel like the 90s were 100 years ago as, as opposed to 30 years ago. Uh, but I digress. Uh, Mr. Leeson here in conversation with the CBC uh, says that he thinks it's a little early. He says that the Saskatchewan government, the Mo government, should be waiting for courts to rule on the school gender policy, on this so-called fight for parents' rights. Uh, it's obviously getting a lot of attention uh, across the country. Not a great look, I don't think, for Saskatchewan here, but politicians like Premier Higgs as well uh, out in the Maritimes are seeing that, you know, quietly, I think a lot of people support this fight. And it seems to be, to be not as much of a, a political hot potato as some people might think. What do you make of what's going on in Saskatchewan in particular? Well, you know, the, the, the business about uh, parental rights, uh, many people see this uh, in many different ways. Uh, because of what I have done for a living for my entire adult life, uh, I just got a, a lot of stories over the years, which were verified, corroborated, authenticated uh, from young people who were no longer young people. They were talking about what it was like to be a young person under the thumb. Generally, it was under the thumb of an abusive uh, father. And generally, it was uh, the business about uh, gay men and uh, young gay men and gay boys were, and to, to use an expression that was on on Twitter earlier today, uh, where, where a father would be so abusive that he would try to beat, quote, I mean, I'm quoting now, beat the queer out of the person. Um, and just my take on this for, for decades has been that some people who cannot win an argument with their, with their minds um, go for something else. Uh, they go for their hands, and uh, they sometimes have a, a stick or a whip or some other tool in their hands and and they will actually beat a, a child generally it's a male child on this on this issue and so over the years you know we talk about biases and i always say i put all my biases in the shop window it's impossible for me to think about this quote parental rights issue and uh, children not wanting to share everything with certain parents it's impossible for me not to look at the reality that i've been confronted with in terms of uh, my own listeners and readers and viewers sharing their stories with me of why it is difficult to talk about uh, your your gender issue, if you have one, uh, with um, an abusive parent. And uh, I'm not suggesting that all parents are abusive, and I'm not suggesting that all parents who want as much information on their children are abusive or anything of the sort. I'm simply saying that it's hard for me uh, to not admit uh, that I have a bias in favor of kids mm. uh, who uh, who don't have a father like Ryan Jesperson has and a father li like I had. If if Dr. Bruce, which is what uh, we, we call Ryan's dad, if, if Dr. Bruce and my dad, the late uh, Mike Adler, if every, if every uh, son had a Mike Adler or a Dr. Bruce, we wouldn't be talking about this. Yeah, and, and it's also kind of strange, you know, sometimes um... – you know, you, you see a phrase and then the phrase becomes kind of the banner uh, for a movement. And then the movement, warts and all, kind of reflects on the phrase. And then you find yourself like, are you for or against parents' rights? Or that this is the parents' rights movement. And you sit there and go, well, well like, that's a little, like, I do think that that parents should have some right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, you know, people You know, when say, it comes to, it's, it's difficult for me because, you know, when it comes to women's rights, we understand that women were oppressed uh, for 
thousands and thousands of years. When it, when it comes to uh, gay rights, uh, LGBT rights, we understand uh, about the oppression. So uh, we we generally understand that rights, you know, civil rights, which you know for the most part was was about blacks uh, being oppressed in, in many countries, but especially in the United States, that's most of our, our experience with civil rights, Martin Luther King, etc. And so we generally look at rights as, as something that people who are put down need to liberate themselves, to make themselves equal. So, I mean, I'm a parent, you're a parent. I mean, when I when I hear the word parental rights, uh, you know, my my first impression when, I, when I'm not thinking about what I would just talked about a few moments ago, my first impression is gimmick. You know, like uh, I, I'm not, I'm not oppressed because I'm a parent. You're not, you're not oppressed, and so it does feel a little bit on the on the gimmicky side. And of course, uh, in the Canadian context, when so many of the people who are involved in this parental rights movement are exactly the same people who are convoy people and anti-vax people, it just uh, to me, uh, it, I'm not saying I don't take it seriously as an issue. It's a serious issue, but the idea that 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 parents don't have rights. You know, part of my brain just checks out. Yeah, I I, I think it's the same. Uh, Murray Mandrick had a, a really good column. Um, you know, I appreciate Murray's work uh, over the weekend in Post Media Papers talking about this and and how you know Mo is using the notwithstanding clause potentially and probably against even the advice of his own uh, legal team, uh, his senior advisors, and and how he was looking for that blunt instrument because of the political power of what he's doing. I just think that people and, and members of the general public, you know, I don't know if, it, you know, it's an insult to the public to say are being duped, but I think certainly being manipulated. And again, like <laughs> you want to talk about phrases, just two benign words that now have come to have so much meaning, the both sides idea. Like I think, yeah. you know, to yeah. a certain degree, I'll side with, you know, in this circumstance, if I have to choose, I think traditionally marginalized children that can find themselves terrified and living on an island. Um, but at the same time, like to be forced to choose by, by one group that says basically like, you know, you got to pick and like, you know, here like, you know, either, you know, the one side like wants kids to die and you go, okay, well, hang on a second. And then the other side goes, well, we want all parents kept in the dark on all things. And it's like, well, you know, and, and none of that is actually really happening. I mean, not to say that when Parker, tragic when outcomes Parker and others like, like David Parker, when they're out there, and they, he didn't say this on your show, but you know he said it. I mean, it's, no, he it's behaved tape, himself on our show. I'm sorry. He behaved himself on this show. Yeah, he behaved him. He was that, that was the good David Parker. Okay, but the rally David Parker talks about uh, parents having uh, to, you know parents to you know rally around this parental rights thing because you know teachers some teachers are are, are wanting to you know remove the genitals from from their kids. Uh, now I, I think that you have to be you know well south of a loon. Uh, to, to buy that, uh, as I've said a, a gazillion times, whether it's to Albertans or Manitobans or Ont Ontarians, British Columbians, you know, most of us know teachers. Most of us have teachers in our family. And Uncle Bill and Aunt Sally uh, didn't get into the teaching profession and uh, don't get up in the morning uh, hoping that they can convince someone uh, to, to have their genitals removed. I mean, it's, it's just a ridiculous argument. And because those people are the ones who are most vocal about parental rights, once again, many of us just end up checking out, thinking this is just another right-wing gimmick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you about uh, uh, what's, I mean, obviously we talked a little bit uh, last week about Wab Canoe's uh, win in Manitoba and, and yeah. the dynamic If people want to check out our episode last week on the Tuesday, uh, just after the Thanksgiving break. Your thoughts on the impact that it may have, probably will have early, uh, not just in Manitoba, but across the Prairie Provinces and across the country. Uh, Manitoba's outgoing premier, you know, she who lost the election, Heather Stephenson, in uh, what she's described as her final interview as premier uh, with the CBC basically apologizing for uh, a campaign that she said she was uncomfortable with. We talked about it at length on the show. I think, you know, probably uh, the two most notable uh, just, just sort of like bizarre moments in that campaign. Um, one of them hours before people were heading to the polls, a billboard, uh, a billboard campaign, many billboards saying stand firm against the landfill search. Everybody knows the story there. And then also the, 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 the newspaper and digital campaign around. Nobody knows who you're voting for. You don't have to tell anybody. Basically, even if you yourself are embarrassed 
about the way you're going to vote for us, uh, please still do it. And uh, in this interview with the CBC, we'll play a quick snippet here, Chuck, uh, before we get you to respond. She essentially apologizes for it and says she was deeply uncomfortable with the campaign from the outset. I think it's been negative. Um, there's been a, a lot of negativity, even for the last two years since I became Premier. Um, the, the, the negativity against me started then. And, you know, it's continued. I, I don't like the negativity. I really don't. Um, but I will say, like, I, yeah, I don't get into the weeds on the campaign. But I certainly, I'm very, I'm very proud of the campaign that, that we ran. And, and Marnie did a great job. And there's so many people that helped out on that campaign. And I just want to thank them for what they did. And, um, you know, was there, you know, maybe a part of it that um, there were some unintended consequences where we hurt some people? You know, I don't, you know, you know, I, I, I apologize for that because um, I, you know, it was not intended. I mean, I think that part's bullshit about unintended consequences. I think if you didn't see some negative consequences, I don't know what the fuck you were thinking. But... If, you, if, if you or I insulted the hell out of people, like... whether they're uh, Palestinian people, Jewish people, indigenous people, Albertans, whoever, you know, if, if we insulted the hell out of, out of people, and then said, you know, uh, it really didn't mean to do it. I, I guess if you feel insulted, I guess I apologize. I mean, uh, you and I would be taken to the woodshed by our our, our listeners, our readers, our viewers. They, they wouldn't put up with that because that's not a fulsome, authentic Ryan Jesperson or Charles Adler apology. That is what you just said it was. It's, it's, it's a bullshit ap apology. And, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, she doesn't get into the weeds and, and whatever, and you know, it's been negative for the last uh, couple of years. I mean, this this was a campaign that 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 billboard was making one point and one point only. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people want your money. Indigenous people want Manitoba's tax dollars. We're standing up to them. Meaning. The guy we're running against, who happens to be Indigenous, Wapkanu, he will give Indigenous people your money. We won't. That's what that ad is. That's the message. And if anyone in this country thinks that's a good message, either morally, ethically, or even politically, the person who thinks that should not be earning a single dollar as a strategist looking for seats in what I'll call moderate urban and suburban Canada. If you if you want to get if you want to, you know, uh, tr try your luck in in, in some parts of, of, of rural Canada, great. Uh, but in 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 diverse, moderate, urban and suburban Canada, that's as stupid as it gets. She should have apologized for signing off on a stupid campaign that insults not just Indigenous people, it insults all Manitobans. And yes, it insults all Manitoba PCs. And the NDP could not have won in this province had a number of Manitoba PCs not crossed over all the way into, into NDP land. I didn't go all the way into NDP land, so I... You know, I voted. I voted liberal that. because I have to. I have to vote, but there's no way that I could vote for the party that I almost always vote for in Manitoba. I couldn't vote for the. Yeah, Manitoba you've clarified party. that several times on the show. I find that interesting. You're you're letting us know. You've said it several times publicly that you didn't vote for the PCs. You weren't going to vote for the PCs, but you've also wanted to clarify who you did vote for. What's what's? Yeah, I always I always tell people this is one of my. I, I realize some people, uh, you know, don't believe in that. Uh, I, I once again, I put all of the biases right. In, in, in the shop window for you. Nobody has to reveal to you what Charles Adler does. But I will I will always tell people how, how I vote mm. once I have voted. I, yeah. mean, uh, I honor the secret ballot. Fine, it's a secret. I'm voting in secret. But after that, I will uh, I will tell people how I voted because I feel uh, I owe it to you. You know, once again, it, it comes under the so-called bias discussion. Now, everybody's uh, biased, uh, though. Can we get... Can well, we, can I'm, we just, just, I'm just... You know, I, 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 Every single I, person I, I, is biased. I need for people to know that just because I have biases doesn't mean that I don't listen to the other side. Yeah. Doesn't mean that I can't be fair. I just need for people to know that I'm a real human being and all human beings have biases. Yeah. And those people who are involved in, in, in journalism or commentary who claim they are above that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm above, but that, that's like saying I'm, I'm not really a human being or I'm some sort of a superhuman. So I'm yeah. not into the supremacy business and saying that somehow my values are supreme to other Canadians values. That's nonsense. And one of the, you know, the the country I I mentioned a few moments ago, whose whose earth I I, I, I you know I, I kiss from time to time. That is Canadian earth. One of the reasons I love Canada is I believe. 
that in this country, we do really believe in our hearts and souls, we believe that we are all equal. And that's why that ad that did not get a fulsome apology uh, from uh, the premier, it got a, a BS political apology. That ad essentially was saying, no, no, we're not all equals. Mm. And on the campaign against Wab Canoe, uh, the, the message of the, you know, that the violence is bad now, but boy, it'll get even worse with him. You know, that message was also clearly tinged with racism. That message was, we are all, all of us believe that all of us are, are, are capable of, of coming back from whatever whatever sins uh, we have uh, committed. Uh, we, we believe in redemption for everyone, but not this guy not this indigenous guy and maybe not indigenous people. Mm. It's a sick message and uh, they deserve to lose. Yeah. Uh, before we go, I want to ask you about uh, Jagmeet Singh, uh, leader of the federal NDP for now. Um, you know, I through high school, Chuck would have been thrilled uh, with 81% on any test, on yeah. any assignment. No question. Uh, but 81%, uh, not great for a federal party leader when, when essentially put to a confidence vote the members of their own party. For context, uh, when NDP members in uh, 2018 uh, were asked how they felt about the leader, he had a 91% approval rating. Pretty good. Yeah. You'd actually hope it to be even higher. Uh, remember, for, for our audience members, we're not talking about how politicians like premiers or the prime minister poll among the general public. We're talking about party members here. You want to be at like 95% if you can. So, uh, you know, five years ago, he had 91% support. Two years ago, he had 87% support. And just two years later, this year, he's got 81%, down 10% points uh in the last five years uh what do you read into it does Chuck Meet Singh stay on as the leader of the NDP is this a win for people within the party that may come for him or for the yeah. liberals or what well his, his problem is is he did this uh, so-called supply agreement uh, which uh, props up the liberal government and over the course of history if you study any uh, and it's generally the NDP um and it's generally you know in, in provinces any uh any party that props up a government eventually loses support because most people who are proud NDPers, and I don't know what that's like, but I'm, you know, I've got some empathy here uh, for, for every, every human being, regardless of their political choices. And it, I don't think it's difficult for us to understand that if you're a proud NDPer, if your guy is seen as a political prop for not just a few months, but now years, um, that that's going to wear on people. They, they don't want their leaders to be political props. They want them to be strong individuals. I mean, he can make the case that the government is, is doing things that they ordinarily would not do. Maybe, maybe pharmacare, certainly uh, dental care and some other things. Uh, so he can, he can make that case, and I'm sure he made the case to the convention. But there are a number of people, in this case, nine, at least 19%, uh, who are willing to say this isn't good enough. Yeah. Do you see anybody in the federal party that, that you think could be next leader? Like I, I, I look at, uh, you know, people talk about Justin Trudeau's fate. Um, seems like those closest to him are indicating most of them off the record that, you know, he intends fully on f fighting against Pierre Polyev into the next election, that Trudeau it, it appears intent on sticking around. You, you can yeah. you can sort of come up with a short list of names of people who could be well, I've got uh, a name. the next I've got a name leader. For you. I've got a name for you for, for, for the someone NDP? who I think could be a wonderful national NDP leader. Rachel, Rachel, Notley. Rachel Notley, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's the one I endorsed New Year's Eve for Premier of Alberta. I'd be intellectually very inconsistent if I endorsed someone for Premier of Alberta an NDP person, which I've never done in my life, and 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 not uh, not said that she's also capable of being a national NDP uh, leader. She she certainly is a. I think it would be a actually a, a better country, and I think that uh, she would do a marvelous job. But I don't think many NDPers give a hoot about who I who I endorse for the next NDP leader uh, for for someone to succeed. Jagmeet Singh, but I'll tell you uh, that would be. That well, would be strong. If and the people, if the rumor people in mill, Alberta would certainly enjoy people in Alberta would certainly enjoy, um, you know, Rachel Notley, leader of the NDP, going up against Justin Trudeau. That would uh, sell a lot of tickets. Yeah, I mean, if I if I'm thinking off the top of my head, and I'm trying to sort of think of the electoral boundaries and how it all works, but it yeah. it may. Be pro I mean, they'd have to figure something out, but it could be problematic. The, the NDP's got, you know, two seats federally in Edmonton right now. One of them, Heather McPherson, and I'm pretty sure that Rachel Notley lives in Heather McPherson's riding. They, anyway, whatever. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, if the rumor mill is accurate, uh, Albertans will expect to see probably uh, some, you know, leadership race, uh, if not rumblings, actually triggered. Uh, could be over the next couple of months, could be into the spring, but uh, 
you know, we'll see what happens there with the Alberta NDP that Rachel Notley could and most likely will be stuck. I don't think that that's groundbreaking news to anybody. I don't think that that's a big no, revelation. No, I, mean, I, I don't like, think anyone expects it, Rachel Notley to run against no. Danielle Smith again. I mean, that's, no. that's just that wouldn't be that wouldn't be wise, uh, you know been there done that uh, so Rachel Notley might be looking for another opportunity but I'm 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 not her I'm not her manager I'm not her her agent I'm just someone who endorsed her on New Year's Eve and I always felt strongly about that I I do think that and here it is my small business soul my, the, my, the same soul that supports every single Ryan Jesperson client I do believe that Rachel Notley would have been better for small business in Alberta. I believe she would have been better for education. I can't imagine her putting a, a moratorium on alternates uh, as Danielle Smith has. I just I, I just think that she would have been a, a breath of fresh air for business in Alberta. And if I didn't think that, would never have endorsed her. Hmm. I was talking to the CEO of Kubi Energy, uh, Jake Kubiski, who, by the way, uh, is nominated right now as one of the Ernst & Young Entrepreneurs of the Year, which is an enormous honor. This this young guy, he's not even 40 yet, uh, and is building something remarkable. I w- was chatting with him just a few days ago, and I said, how is this moratorium, Alberta's moratorium on wind and solar, impacting you guys? He said, well, to be honest, that's not the space we play in. So he yeah. said it hasn't impacted us at all. He said, if anything, and this is kind of weird, um, now there's there's, there's a two part to this conversation. Uh, number one, though, there's been a real labor shortage um, and they've been working to get their you know solar installation teams as beefed up as they can to keep up with demand. He says, if anything, it's been freeing up labor. So people in residential, commercial, agricultural, solar ha- have actually seen some benefit here. But who is that at the expense of? He goes, you know, it's interesting uh, and, and kind of ironic with this provincial moratorium on the big wind and solar we're talking about the solar farms and, and stuff like that the seven month moratorium he goes it's it's pissing off like the big construction companies pcl lead core all these huge multi-billion dollar companies that are working on these big projects and, and it's not every day you see a conservative government pissing off the big multi-billion dollar construction companies so I thought this, that was an this interesting moderate, angle. this moderate conservative is about to piss off some some people who are scheduled to uh, <laughs> to show up at my door in 62 seconds from right now. No. You're out of here, buddy. I'm sorry. Uh, you usually you usually dismiss me politely. Uh, you know, we had a lot to talk about hour. today. So, so I, I told them it was OK, you know, to show up here at 930 Mountain. So my apologies for that. No, don't apologize. Okay. Get out of here. We'll talk to you in a week. OK, <laughs> thank you, man. Love it. Love that guy. That's Charles Adler. You can find him on Twitter at. Charles Adler, and of course, subscribe to his podcast, the Charles Adler Show. You can read his column weekly in the Winnipeg Free Press. A lot of ground to cover there, uh, which is kind of what we look for on a Monday. Mm-hmm. We'll check in with the Emmy Award winner. <laughs> I, lo- I love me some Charles, especially right early in the morning. He's like a strong cup of coffee every every Monday. Well, I appreciate that too. That like this this talk about bias. Uh, he he and I were chatting about that this week off the air, and and uh, he says, you know, if, if we don't want to get into certain things, I understand that. He says, I bring bias to the table. I said, everybody, everybody does yeah. brings bias to the table. Mm-hmm. You know, people act like that's some sort of like ha gotcha. Like this person's showing their bias in their response to their opinion mm-hmm. to this. Sure, just like everybody else, your lived experience your perspective the people close to you the people you love and care about your hey. your past understanding of, of issues i mean all of this forms your bias sucks right now too because this is it's it's like the vaccine debate all over again oh, I, I don't want to talk about israel israel palestine right now it's all i see in my feed i'm i'm consumed by it right now and there's no right stance to take You've got this holy land that's been fought over for not just the last 75 years. Let's no. If you go back, people say, well, this side or this side, like, go back. I mean, Christians, Muslims, Jews, it's the balance of power going back and back, like thousands of years. And all all because of religion, all because of that guy up in the sky. Who's Who's got the right God? And mm. it's just, uh, it's, it's super sad. And the only thing I want to say in any debate is just... It, Children dying is wrong. And Women, children, the elderly, people who can't defend themselves civilians, on any people. side is wrong. It's just a horrible situation. And so I don't even want to I don't even want to discuss it anymore unless we're talking about it on the show. And we're talking to people who actually know what they're talking about. Yeah, I understand it. And uh, and we're continuing to uh, obviously keep an eye on who we think would be voices uh, with credibility that matter on this. And that includes Palestinian perspectives. That includes Israeli perspectives. That includes people from NGOs like the U.N. that are working here 
you know, you point out, which I, I think is uh, obviously a valid point, and, and it might be obvious to some people, but it is important to remember that, that, that this territory, this region, these people, these religions, all, you know, it, it, there has been warring and fighting and territory claims and animosity uh, for, for millennia. And for that reason, a lot of people go, well, it's just never going to get better. Like, it's just never, there will never be peace in the Middle East. This is just, there's never going to be an improvement. It's here. hard to and see a resolution. It's hard to just go, yeah. well, well, okay. I mean, I guess we'll, I, I, okay. That's you not know, what we could. We'll we, turn the page on it no. next, you know. We you have can't. to figure something out. It's just, it's, I, I, I don't see what the solution is because both sides want the other to just leave completely, right? It's, yeah. you're well, never going to have, I, I don't ever see people sitting down and saying, hey, let's split the land 50-50. You know what I mean? It's just. So I well, and you see, like you know, Israeli troops mobilizing on the on the border there into Gaza, um, and and you see uh, civilian targets being hit, and the reality is that that Hamas is, uh, and I won't get too far to my depth here, but an unconventional fighting force in the sense that a lot of their military assets, a lot of their assets, uh, you know, are, are in urban areas, which the, the obvious thing that we can draw from that as uh, tension escalates and fighting escalates and it looks like it's only going to get worse is that the civilian toll will be worse. And, uh, and, and here we sit and watch in horror um, you know, I saw this, you know, somebody was talking, and, and again, I'm not trying to pile on people of faith, and, and you know, let's just leave it at that, uh, but somebody was talking the other day about how, you know, th this hypothetical where, where the, the rapture had come and gone, um, and, uh, you know, someone's looking at somebody else and says, well, where, where is everybody? Mm -hmm. where, where, where is everyone? And they say, well, the rapture happened, and... And, and and all the religious people are now gone, and they say, "Well, that's terrible." <laughs> well, I and, saw and, this. And yeah. somebody said, "Well, not not really, because nobody's really fighting anymore, and everybody's getting yeah, along." Yeah, we're all good. Where everything. <laughs> <laughs> it is horrible, though, that like you know, you know, all it, literally every religion on earth preaches. You know, like the first rule is always, you know, treat your fellow man the way you want to be treated, and all we've got is this just this this ongoing. Yeah. Aaron says, you know, women, children, uh, the elderly, uh, the most vulnerable says, but also the men says like, a lot of them oh, didn't of choose this there. And, and for sure, but it says they're you know, obliged to participate as members of a nation. I mean, you know, I, I uh, only say that because most of the time the men are. The, and let's be honest, they're the ones doing the killing. That, that's that. That's just, you know, mm. <laughs> they're, they're the majority of the people who are, are, are the aggressors. Right. Yeah. Uh, on either side. So. But, uh, Interesting uh, hearing Charles suggest Rachel Notley is the next leader, potentially the federal. Yeah. He's not the first to do it. Obviously, I think she's one of the one of the first names that comes to mind. And maybe that's not. Uh, and this is nothing against uh, Rachel. Um, but it's not the hugest compliment maybe to the federal NDP in the sense that I just <laughs> no. don't. I just don't know that there's like a lot of. Who, who would be this not to say there aren't people that don't work hard, people that connect with their community, members of parliament that work in, in earnest and all that. But but you don't see like I think any good political party wants to have rising stars mm -hmm. uh, as much as a leader would want to stifle those rising stars. Right. For their own self-preservation. But you can come up with a list of names. I mean, Pierre Polyev was one of those names for the conservatives for several years. And before him, there were many others. People would. You know, talk about, you know, Jason Kenney and John Baird and P Peter McKay and Ronna Ambrose and, and uh, you know, the list goes on uh, with the federal liberals. You could do the same with Christian Freeland and Anita Anand and Mark Carney and the, the list goes on there. But with the federal NDP, like who really? Um, so we'll see about the Rachel Notley thing uh, next time we talk to her. Uh, be sure to obviously ask about that. We do expect to see some news over the next number of weeks or months uh, relating to her career her political career provincially speaking with the alberta ndp this conversation was presented by our friends at complete care restoration you know they're known uh, for their work helping people get back on their feet get their lives their businesses their homes back after the nightmare that is fire and flood uh, they do a lot of work helping people out in, in maybe unforeseen circumstances uh, you know stuff like mold and asbestos you know you're expecting to just knock a wall out and open up your kitchen and and then all of a sudden you realize that the job's a little bit bigger than you thought it would be. Familiar story. They know it. And that's why they've got a team of trained professionals. They can assist in sampling and analysis of building materials to ensure that hazardous substances are properly addressed. If the minute that that sledgehammer goes into the drywall, you realize something might be amiss, make Complete Care Restoration your first call at 780-454-0776. Plus... This is a team that understands construction and renovation big time. We know this. They built our studio. If you're looking at maybe converting an office building or you're looking at a big 
overhaul. Could be a residence, could be a commercial space. Look up Complete Care Restoration at completecarerestoration.ca. Every Monday or the first show of every week, our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy give us an opportunity to step out of the news cycle, at least with the heavy stuff, and remind ourselves that good things are happening around us. It's a tradition we call Positive Reflections, and we wanted to shine the spotlight this week on Sam Kaplan. This is such a great story. This is one of the best stories I've seen all year so far. Sam Kaplan is 72 years of age, and this year, he finally turned his tassel. Yeah, that's right. More than 50 years after he graduated high school, Sam became the first of his seven siblings to earn a bachelor's degree. He received a diploma in cinema and media arts, so we especially love it, uh, from Georgia Gwinnett College in Lawrenceville, Georgia. This was a promise that he had made to his mom. She's 99 years of age, and she was there She was there to see him walk across the stage and grab his degree. She said that she was excited, happy, and proud. She was last uh, there in attendance with her son in a robe in 1969 when Sam graduated high school, but he had always promised his mom that this was something he was going to do. And so he heard on the radio that this college was offering a degree that involved script writing. He'd always wanted to be a script writer, Johnny. He says, so he felt like his car developed automatic steering. He said, as he heard the radio, hey, advertising works, everybody. Yeah. As he heard the radio ad, he said he literally was coming. He was like a few minutes away from the off-ramp. He took the off-ramp from when he was driving to the college. He popped in and he enrolled. This was so very cool. He says he's met so many new younger friends. He was the oldest guy in his class by a mile. He was joking about that. But he says he's excited to learn more about the opportunity in his new career, his goals for the future. But most importantly, that moment where he fulfilled his promise to his mom graduating with a bachelor's degree at 72 years of age. I don't know the guy, uh, but as soon as I saw that photo of him and his mom, uh, she was there, the smile. She's just beaming as she holds that piece of paper, uh, her son presenting it to her. Can you imagine the feeling? How cool is that? Incredible. 99 years of age. If you see a story, or maybe you are the story, and you just know people would be inspired by it, uh, uh, something you see in the world around you, a random act of kindness, or paying it forward, let us know about it. Send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Put positive reflections in the subject line. You can see it featured in a future episode of Real Talk. Don't forget, you can get a free solar quote today by visiting kubienergy.ca. Wanted to put a couple of things on your radar before we go. Number one, if you go to casamentalhealth.org, you can get your tickets for the October 28th show, Barney Bentall and the Caribou Express. It's a fundraising concert in support of mental health services for children and youth in Alberta. I'm going to be hosting it at Festival Place in Sherwood Park. We're so excited for this night. Again, all of the proceeds toward a very important cause. And plus, you get to hear Barney Bentall and the Caribou Express. You can check out the events link at casamentalhealth.org. Org. Don't forget, this is going to sell out, so you want to get your tickets today. And coming up on Wednesday's show, one of the greatest NHL goaltenders of all time, plus a former Liberal MP, you know Ken Dryden. He's going to be joining us on Wednesday's show. That's two days from now, talking about his new book. Make sure you circle it on the calendar and don't miss it. Make it a great Monday, friends. We'll talk to you again soon. Real Talk is hosted